Yes. Hello, we are waiting for somebody. Uh, Professor Wu. Professor Wu, yeah. Is Professor Wu is going to he will join us later? Okay. I think we better start, yeah. We better start. Good afternoon. Kyle Kun. Barry Jackson, ma? Jackson, Otien Jackson? Carry me out, carry me out, carry me out. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, welcome to uh, this section. It's, um, it's on best practices. We have uh, officers, high officers of, university, of educational institutions here and somebody from the business environment but actually pays close attention to higher education, especially in the business arena. I've told them seven minutes for each person to give a, a short uh, presentation. But Annie, I've been generous enough, I give Annie about two or three minutes of my time, so I only talk about for five minutes, and uh, so that she can give us her own take on uh, higher education from the business point of view. Let me just introduce uh, my colleagues here. Annie Lo, right now, from uh, Singapore, but actually from San Francisco, okay? She's the Senior Vice President and Chief Officer in the Pacific uh, Environment for AACSB International, and that is Association of Advanced Collegiate Schools of Business. She said, she's a financial person, knows how to count money. <laughs> And we all need that in higher education, okay? I'll talk to you after, the, after this whole thing, okay? Uh, she worked for CFA Institute in uh, that's Chartered Financial Account Analyst. CFA. CFA analyst. Okay, gives director. And also at Schwab Investments. So, as I said, she's been very much involved in money. But presently, working with the accreditation agencies, of uh, the business school. So welcome, Annie. Thank you. I don't have to say anything. I know this gentleman here. We are colleagues at University of Illinois. He was there as head of chemical engineering department and also the vice chancellor for research at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, after that, did some stint in Singapore, like you, working at something called ASTAR, which is their research agency. But presently, the uh, Provost at State University of New York, Buffalo. So welcome, Chip Charles Zukowski. I'm Professor Isaac Froman. Uh, <clears throat> used to work at the World Bank. So we have a lot of people who can count money here, actually. So, <laughs> so don't forget that. World Bank, and my understanding, it was part of the team that did the first international review of higher education in Kazakhstan as, as a, an employee of World Bank. But now, is the head of the Educational Institute of Education at, at the Higher School of Economics in, uh, in Moscow. So welcome. Uh, Professor Wu, hopefully you'll be here, is the Vice President of uh, Renmin University in China. But we'll hopefully you'll be here. But, oh, you don't have to clap yet. Don't clap yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Best practices in the age of disruption. Can you really say best practices? Are there best practices when everything is being disrupted? So it's very difficult to, to say we have a universal best practices. So can only say best practices according to maybe the type of education you want to receive, the type of institution you belong to. So today we'll try to figure out what are the best practices in their institutions. Education is individual in a sense. We all learn differently. Whether it's when you are young, you learn differently when, than when you become an adult. So it's very, it's individual, it runs across the ages. Maybe you have lifelong education, you can learn differently at every stage. So I won't say there are best practices, but there are practices. Every institution has to define their own practice. So you have to present an, a menu of opportunities for students to learn. 
Okay, learn according to your according to your speed. Right now, it's a little bit. We try to do things homogeneously, but each institution has to decide. Each institution has to decide what they want to do. I can only give few examples from my previous institution. Institution. When I became dean at that time, I found that many of the students in engineering, the graduation rate was something like 40 something percent in, in four years. Only 40 something percent in four years. But these were some of the best students that we could get from Illinois State. So why will we be doing that? Bringing terrific students and within four years, they can graduate, and if six year, usually in the US, six year average uh, graduation, that's what is counted, so it's only about 60 something percent. Whereas on the campus, it was about 85 percent. So what we tried to do was to start looking at how students learn and how you put them together in teams to really still feel, from the, from the freshman year, to feel that they are students in the, on campus and to actually believe that they are engineers and they can become engineers. So we put teams together to start, what is your motivation? What do you want to do? You want to invent the world, which most of the students want to invent the world. You want to become an entrepreneur. So we channel their motivation, put them in teams, brought people from outside the campus who are alumni to come and talk to them. What is your passion? And also make them work in teams. And this was based on examples from Olin College, I think. Dr. Sami mentioned that yesterday. Olin College, which was only 300 students, and my school, which was 11,000 students. So that's a, a different thing. So we have transplant some best practices from that small school, brought into the uh, big college, used a small sample of students to start looking. And based on that, we start, started seeing positive results. So we said, OK, from this, we'll now have what we call a design center. A design where students will actually come and do things practically. And when I became provost, I transported to the, to the campus level. And now, if you go to you know, on the southern part of the campus, they are building a $48 million building, which is a design center, where we bring engineering students, students from the arts, humanities, business, working together from the first, first, for, for the first year. And what we noticed with engineering was that Within the seven or eight years, really, the graduation rate went from 40-something percent to 70-something percent within a period of about five or six years. So we saw that students who are actually motivated brought together to learn collectively and believe that they belong in the university, whatever ethnic, ethnic or social, uh, social economic background you came from, could be successful. That's one thing. The other thing that we did was, in terms of technology, what are the new things that are coming? We created a course called CS plus X. CS, computer science plus X, where X can be anything. It could be English, math, chemistry, arts. So you specialize, you have uh, CS, computer science, which is about 55% of the curriculum, with whatever you want to do, whether it's philosophy, and now it's becoming the largest, uh, largest specialty on campus at Illinois. Because a lot of students want to get into that. How do you become leader or how to use data in your discipline? So those are the things that we're thinking of. I won't get, go beyond that, but we'll discuss some of these things as we move along in the, in the, in the, in the talk today. So there are many things you can do, as I said, Education is individual. Some people like it structured. Some people like it unstructured. Universities will always be around. That's my, my own belief. Because I want my own 17-year-old to go to a university and socialize. They have to socialize. The university is just not just for the education that you learn in the classroom, but how you talk to each other, your age mates, your elders, your juniors, how you interact. So it's extremely important so that universities can, can disrupt everything, but human beings are still human beings. We have to figure out how to educate people, not just for the current job, make people what I call a T individual, learn what you need to do, and also have some breadth to it so you can navigate yourself in life. Okay. 
I'll stop at that. Now I call on Annie. Hmm. Ten minutes. I'll give you ten minutes. Sure. I hope I... Okay, go, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, very happy to be here and I just want to fly through some of my slides because I do have a number of slides here. But I want to really emphasize on some of the things that you know some of our schools around the world are doing. Um, so let's get started. So I just I will give a very brief introduction of AACSB because I, I know a number of you here don't know what AACSB does. And then and then I will also talk about why you know what we do that really works with schools around the world to promote uh, innovation, engagement, and um, and impact. So we've been around for 102 years. Um, we're known as an accreditation agency, but you know what we do is actually beyond accreditation. In fact, ACSB now has three offices around the world. You know, we have Tampa that services the uh, North and South America, re and then the Amsterdam office services the um, Europe, Middle East, and Africa uh, schools. And I actually lead the Singapore office in Asia, so I support all of the schools here in Asia Pacific region, including Australia and New Zealand. We have about um, over 1,600 members around the world, and all of which, you know, about 810 are currently accredited by AACSB. So this is pretty much where we have members around the world. You know, the dark green means we have accredited um, members, and then the light green is where we have members, but they have, there's no accredited members at this point. Just to kind of give you a very quick overview as to the breakout of our member schools around the world, we have, you know, close to 50% in the Americas region, and then in Asia Pacific, we have about 22%, close to 350 members in this region. And all of that, 112 are already accredited by us, 94 are going through the process. And EMEA, you know, we have about 30% of our membership, which is about 450 members. Now, it's very important, what I'm gonna talk about later is really on the mission that we do and the vision. So if you look at what the mission of AACSB, we're here to foster engagement, accelerate in innovation, and also amplify impact in the business education. So we you know, believe that we're here to help support schools around the world. The fact that we have the largest business school network in the world, we feel that we can make an impact by working with these schools, and we are a nonprofit organization. All of our schools are with us to really make a change in this world and making sure that we are doing what we are doing best in you know, supporting the, the, the country, the region, as well as the students and the society. So we actually, I, I mentioned that we are beyond accreditation. So this is a big network with professional development opportunities. And also we have a business education intelligence area where we really look at the industry, the trends, what's going on in business higher education, what is going on that's relevant, that's important. And what I'm gonna talk about is really some of the development that we came through from the business education intelligence that we have. So every year, um, we actually have a challenge for our members, and we actually ask our members to submit stories of things that they, they do really well in terms of impact, engagement, innovations. And, you know, we have hundreds of uh, submissions every year, so I'm going to take you around the world to talk about some of these, you know, the vision that we have at AACSB. We believe there are five opportunities for schools to continue to thrive and do well and in really achieving what they are trying to do. So the first opportunity that we, we, are, we are saying is the catalyst for innovation. We want schools to really think about innovation. It doesn't have to be something that you create from scratch. It could be something like a process or something that you have been doing, but just reinvent and think about what else can you do to improve. There, these are some of the things that we talk about, like new approaches of doing new things, interdisciplinary collaboration, you know, fostering innovation environment in your, in your school, and also looking at what your community needs. So I'm gonna kind of bring you up, you know, take you to the first school, which is located in Chile, in South America. So this school is one of our accredited schools. What they, they found in 2008 is that seven out of 10 small, medium enterprises, which is, you know, entrepreneurs, 
they pretty much you know, are you know, bankrupt in less than 10 years. So what they are trying to do is say, well, wait a minute, our country depends on these people to develop our, you know, our economy and everything. So we need to do something to help these people. So what they did was they actually engaged their faculty members to come up with this new program called PYME. And they actually, the faculty members are doing the, the, the teaching, but then they also engaged their alumni, very good alumni from their schools, to help um, these, uh, sorry, to help these um, entrepreneurs to, to learn from practical experience, how do you keep your business going? And then at the same time, the undergraduate students at the school actually also play a role by being part of this process. They actually accompany the uh, entrepreneurs together to go through the training and learn what they are facing, the actual, so it's really a, a, a life classroom for all of these students. So at the end, the impact I wanted to share with you is that for 92% of the students actually rate the program, you know, like they are very happy with the program. So definitely the school engaged with their own students. And then also another thing is, as you can see, since 2008, 563 entrepreneurs have been trained by this program. And also, they, because it's so popular, they're not just opening up to people in Chile. They actually uh, did it so well that they actually started a MOOC program, which enables people to join this program you know, online. So now it also benefits some of the countries nearby in Mexico, you know, um, other you know, neighboring countries you know, in South America who are Spanish speaking. So this is how, much, how many, what they can do to impact the society, impact the community, to help people to stay in business, to do, you know, support the economy in a very good way. And another good thing out of this is that they are able to engage with their alumni. More than 200 alumni from this school actually participate in, in this program to help their community. This, of course, the, the faculty members were a big con uh, contributor to this whole, the success of this program. The second opportunity I'm going to share with you is, you know, co-creators of knowledge. We all know within the university we have many, many disciplines. So we have this, you know, we all focus on what we do well. And I think same as business. I have to say, you know, because I came from a business background, different departments, they're responsible for different things. So they all look into their area, not really talking to one another. So what we are trying to say is, you know, there are ways for people to connect with one another. Interdisciplinary approach, talking to other disciplines, working with other disciplines, working with business, working with other people within the community, working with the government to come up with something that will benefit the society as a whole. So I'm going to take you, the next school I'm going to take you to is Philippines. We have AIM, which is our school in the Philippines. What they did was, in, in the Philippines, you know Philippines is a country with many islands. So they have you know, very good you know, research and science institutions. And then you also have business schools. But then they are not really talking to each other. So it's kind of like the islands. They all have their specialties, but not really connected. So this program that they develop is called the Leaders in Innovation Fellowship. So what they do is every year, it's a partnership between AIM, the business school, also, you know, the, um, the uh, well, it's funded by the Newton Fund of the UK, and the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering, plus the Philippine Department of Science and Technology. So it's a partnership of three organizations coming together. What they do every year is that they pick 10 researchers from the Philippines and five managerial staff. What they do is AIM actually take these people into the school and give them a three-day and you know, intensive training just to get them started and then ship them over to, um, to um, uh, the UK. And then where they get the engineering you know, training for a few weeks. And then when they come back, they have a re-immerse program for them for a few more weeks just to kind of teach them about your know, business and how to run a business. Because you have these people who are you know, scientists, who are engineers, who are really good in coming up with new ideas, new technology, but they don't know how to run a business. They don't know how to turn their, their, their innovations into something that will benefit in terms of business. 
So at the end, the impact I'm going to talk about is that the program is so successful that the partnership continued. They kept on doing it and AIM kept on getting additional funding to actually improve the program. And if, yes, you can see some of the, the, the bottom are the, some of the innovations, the actual innovations that actually came to the market for the community. So next time I'm going to talk about lifelong learning. Business school is a hub of lifelong learning. I'm sorry. So I'm going to fly very fast. So anyway, I think this is one thing that is important. I think it was mentioned earlier is so one thing that is very important that school don't only think about, okay, once your students graduate and that's it. Really, you know, because of the diff changing environment, people are changing jobs. People need additional skills. So where I'm going to take you to is the United States, University of Cincinnati. So what happened was, back in 2008, you know about the financial crisis that happened. A lot of people got laid off. So what happened? So the school actually recognized that there are a lot of people being laid off. So they actually started this program to help the people in the community to retrain them. Because a lot of them couldn't find jobs. They, they've been working for years. But then they don't know the new skills. So the school actually started this program and helped them to get back to, um, to the society. So at, at, at the uh, result, the impact is they graduate more than 300 unemployed business professionals. And 85% of the graduates have actually accepted a full-time position within three months after they finish the program. So it's definitely something I don't want to spend too much time, but you can read it, and I'm sure you can get a copy of the slide. But it's definitely a way for a business school to say, OK, how can I help people in, this, uh, in our community who's going through a you know, major crisis and help them get back on their feet and go back to, to uh, the workforce. So I have more on lifelong learning, but I think we already spent a lot of time on that. And um, second to the last one is leaders on leadership. So you know, when we are thinking about leaders, when we're thinking about higher education, we always have to think about how do we train our leaders to ensure our leaders are really in a good position to lead the company. And it's not just for corporates, but also for business school, for universities. So I'm going to take you to Australia next. Our school in Australia, actually what they develop is a future academic leaders program because they recognize that a lot of the leaders, potential leaders within the, business, you know, the school lack the management or leadership skills. So they actually created this program and to help develop their own staff, their own faculty members to take on leadership role. And the impact is that you know, they have 60 plus you know, emerging leaders and now they're more engaged with the schools in terms of you know, actually more prepared to take on leadership role and to contribute to the school in a positive way. Also, they came up with some you know, um, projects that they were able to support the schools and resolve some of the issues together as a, as a group. Finally, enablers of global uh, prosperity. So why are we here today? We're here, we're going through higher education because we want to not just be successful ourselves, but really helping with the society to really care about our future. So we need to ed educate our students to also think the same way. So minds, the global mindset, also accepting diversity is very, very important. The next school I'm going to take you to is in India. What happened is in India, a lot of women, after they get married, they drop out of their, their career. They stopped. And then they cannot go back, and they have a problem going back. So, but in India, as you know, you know they have a lot of people, and we, if actually, in fact, if we can get more women to come back to work, we will be able to raise the GDP overall in the world. So, what this school did was they recognized there's an issue with women going back to work. So they actually came up with this 11-month program to train you know, leaders, women, potential women leaders, to come back to the workforce. And through this program, they actually uh, got a lot more corporate companies who are really interested in this program and are actually partnering up with them to come up with a women leadership program. So I'm going to stop here just to tell you there are many ways for you know, schools to thrive and continue to do well at the age of innovation, but you just have to figure out your own way. Thank you. So the, you can see the plethora of uh, examples from different universities. Universities 
in the main should be to train leaders. Okay. Many people think the university should be a job, a job shop, where you actually impact only, uh, what is it called, uh, techniques and technologies and methodologies to students. But my claim, at least, a university like uh, Nazarbayev University should be able to train leaders, people who are going to change their community. And what you see from, uh, from what Annie mentioned is that many universities are striving all over <coughs> the world to really have an impact, but impact in making sure they create leaders who can go and change their society. So, okay. Okay. thank yeah. you. Thank you, Adi. First, I'd like to thank um, uh, President Katsu and Adi for inviting me and for you to be here today. Um, I be keep learning more about Kazakhstan, and um, I am uh, terribly impressed with the ambition of the country and the region and uh, the directions that it's going, the willingness to invest in education as a cornerstone of um, growing the region. And it's a real honor to be here to um, talk about the ideas that we're working on at the University at Buffalo. Uh, we are um, uh, feeling the same pressures as um, we have been talking about here today. We worry about um, how we're going to educate the next generation, how digitization is changing, uh, what we're doing, and um, uh, uh, how we can advance the educations of leaders, professionals, and um, citizens. And the point that I would like to talk about today, I'm going to give two examples drawn from the University at Buffalo. And the point I'm trying to make is it isn't just changing the way we teach the students to do engaged classrooms or flipped classrooms or use digital technologies differently, but we probably, we administrators, probably have to change the way we think about the way we structure um, our universities and the way we incentivize faculty. And uh, so those are going to, that's the point of the examples I'm going to give you. So let me start first by just describing uh, the University at Buffalo. We are part of a system of universities in the state of New York. We're the largest and most comprehensive. There are 12 different schools that have all of the health sciences and all the other schools that um, make up sort of all the matter and uh, that, that humans study and, and do um, research in and educate um, about. Uh, we have about 30,000 students. 20,000 of those are undergraduate. 10,000 of those are graduate and uh, professional students. We draw heavily from the state of New York. About 85% of our students come from New York, and most of the rest actually come from around the world um, instead of just around the United States. We're situated in the city of Buffalo, and we call the city of Buffalo a legacy city. And what that means is that Buffalo had a thriving economy, um, generated tremendous wealth in 1900, and uh, then it collapsed, tremendous economy through the 60s, and it collapsed when the steel industry in the United States collapsed. And so for the last um, 50 years, it has been recovering. Right now, it is recovering, and the economy is uh, being based on a growth in um, sort of uh, health sciences and uh, biotechnology, but it retains a, a large manufacturing base, mostly in small and medium-sized manufacturing um, companies. So the economy is coming back, and the University at Buffalo is seen as a cornerstone building the knowledge-based economy um, of the future. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can work with the city of Buffalo and with Western New York in order to be major contributors to the um, society um, and uh, to the growth of the economy. So with that in mind, the first example of, of um, I don't know if it's a best practice, it's simply how UB is responding to the pressures that we're feeling, but the first example I'd like to give is one how we're contributing in um, economic development to, to the local economy. And the standard model is that uh, a faculty member gets a grant, they get a patent, they do a startup company, they amass capital, and they try to then grow the um, economy. Um, we are trying a, a different route in order to engage the small and medium-sized companies around us. And we're finding that a good model for that is to build a program that is independent of the university. 
An example of this is the Jacobs Institute, which is um, focused on um, educating people about the next generation of neurosurgical um, technologies. It's a legally separate entity. It makes its living, it generates its income through continuing education of surgeons around the country or around the world. Uh, they pay in order to learn about how to use the new technologies. That means that the uh, Jacobs Institute has to um, understand the major producers of those technologies. They have to work with the hospitals in order to have the patients to demonstrate those technologies on. But then the staff of the Jacobs Institute are incentivized to know about the assets that exist at the University at Buffalo, the surgeons and all of the other assets that are there. And by having all of those linkages, they are able to keep themselves as a viable, not-for-profit organization uh, where the staff get up every morning and worry about how to translate new technologies into saving lives through neurosurgery, but they aren't tied to the time frame of the university semester-long schedule. They aren't worried necessarily about publishing papers. They are simply there to translate technology um, into the hospital um, environment. One of the advantages of their model is that it means that they don't just look at the STEM fields per se. They ha can reach anywhere in the university in order to find talent and they take interns, which is a great boon to us, not only from um, the health sciences, say from the medical school, but also from engineering, from law, um, from the business school, and use those within the institute in order to advance the technologies that we're um, working on. There are a series of examples like that that are taking place in Buffalo where there are entities that are separate from the university that are harvesting technologies, but their expertise is, isn't necessarily in the university, but they use the assets of the university to translate technologies um, outside. Um, the second program I'd like to talk about is sort of interdisciplinary education programs that we're looking at. We're finding at the University of Buffalo that our faculty are driven to create new sorts of degrees where the content of those degrees cuts across not just departments under one dean, but actually knowledge that is drawn from many deans portfolios, and we're having to totally redevelop the way we work with faculty in order to make that happen. The example is the Institute on Genomic Literacy uh, that we've created. It builds on a great deal of expertise across our campus in the genome, but it is explicitly not a research institute. It's an educational program, and the faculty have gotten together to say society as a whole needs to understand genomics, whether you're an MD, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're in social work, whether you're in literature. You have to understand the genome because it's going to change our lives and they are developing educational programs where the education is drawn from seven different colleges. The medical school, uh, nursing, uh, pharmacy, College of Arts and Sciences where a lot of that is both in psychology um, and um, in ethics, um, uh, in um, social work, in law. All of those schools are getting together to provide content of the degrees that are going to be offered Offered. Now the challenges that we work on are then how to link faculty. The, the model is, is, you know, department chair tells the faculty you have to teach these courses. Now the faculty and they're associated with discipline and they have to do the care and feeding of their majors. Now we're creating a model where the faculty have another boss and it's the director of a program and therefore you're doing sort of a matrix managed effort where faculty will be evaluated by the director of the program and their department chair. Not only that, we have to somehow get seven deans to get together and keep this program going. And that means all these deans have to actually collaborate. And it turns out the incentive structures there we've never developed before, and that is a difficult problem uh, that we're working on. The model we now have to look after these multidisciplinary programs um, involves sort of a council of deans, those deans whose faculty are teaching in it. Um, they, underneath that, is the director of the program, and that poor director reports to multiple deans in order to keep the program going. We're finding that you need a convener out of my office, out of the the provost's office that is able to keep those deans um, on track and sort of to adjudicate uh, conflicts that might develop when it comes to um, the issues of distributing resources. 
This is a major change in the way we incentivize faculty and the way we think about the way we're going to go forward. But the faculty and the deans believe that the future is these multidisciplinary programs. We have eight to 10 of these that we're developing at UB. And it could be as many as a quarter of our undergraduate students are educated in these areas um, in the future um, as we go forward. They, the faculty are very convinced this is the way uh, we're going to make progress. All right, with that, um, I'll just summarize by thanking the organizers again, and I'll be happy to answer any questions as we go forward. Thank you. One thing I should mention is that there are 38 Nazarbayev University students presently doing summer school at SUNY Buffalo. Yeah. So it's, so love, it. love it. They've been, it's been tracking them and sending pictures to me, so I know where they are all the time. Mm -hmm. okay. Professor Froman? Thanks. Okay. Does it work? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, could you give me a click here? Yeah. Um, it's my great pleasure to to be here. I um, because I do remember. Yeah. I do remember um, our meetings in Astana with Jamil uh, more than ten years ago. Then uh, when. Uh, the representatives of the government discussed with us the idea to have international university in uh, Astana. And dreams uh, sometimes become a reality. And uh, each time I'm coming here, I see the university growing. And um, this is not the reason why I took uh, this as a topic of my presentation. In fact, it's not exactly about the best practice. It's about the strategy that can uh, university take, and probably uh, about the new reality when the strategy of the growth is the only strategy. And I would start from the example of my own university, which is young. <coughs> University. We celebrated 25 years of this university uh, last November. And can you imagine, 25 years ago, a group of five or six young uh, professors of economics uh, came together and uh, started to design a new university. It's extremely difficult to do in well-established system like the Russian system of higher education uh, with its uh, great universities like Moscow State University or Moscow Technical University. And uh, so the idea to create one new university was really considered as, as a crazy idea. But what's surprising, they succeeded. In, uh, in, in just in, the, in a quarter of century, uh, this university became one of the largest universities in the country. Uh, we have now more than 30,000 students in four campuses. And, uh, but the most important is that within the Russian system, this university, uh, it, it still keeps its strange name, Higher School of Economics. Uh, in fact, the origin of this name came from uh, initial cooperation with French uh, academics that wanted to call it Grand Ecole. Uh, yeah. uh, so we, keep, we still keep the strange name, but again, the surprising thing is that in this relatively short period, the university became one of the top five in the country by popularity among the students. So. Uh, it's one of the top five most selective universities among 500 public, uh, almost 500 public and 500 private universities. It's uh, the uh, popularity of this university uh, uh, helps it to become one of the uh, three most expensive uh, for those who pay for their education. and. Uh, even in international ranking, when the reputation is important factor, this university became uh, one of the top Russian universities and the most dynamic. 
how it hell, uh, how it happened. And uh, frankly speaking, I have t to tell you that when I joined this university about six or seven years ago, I was asked to chair the strategy group. And we had a um, simple uh, discussion about two options. One option w was to grow, uh, to increase number of students, to increase number of buildings, to increase number of uh, colleges and schools. And another uh, option was to raise quality. And I, I was among this second party. And I always uh, said that small is beautiful. And uh, our party lost. So the party of growth won. <laughs> and I have to admit that probably they were right. Because, and uh, at this slide you can see uh, you don't need to see the exact numbers. It, it's, it's just a growth of the number of professors from 2000 to 2017, and the number of students also from, from 2004 to 2018. You see the dramatic growth. Uh, and uh, why this is probably the strategy for the university that wants to be successful. And um, uh, yeah, I will tell a few words in the end that our analysis show, uh, shows that the, uh, this, even this type of growth, the growth, the diversification of the universities becoming uh, probably one of the most successful strategy. We uh, recently met President of Arizona State University, Michael Crow, who wrote the book, The Design of New American University. And one thing clearly was, yeah, there were many interesting things, but one statement was really strong. He said, I have more uh, bright students with very high SAT scores than Princeton. But my average uh, GPA or SAT score definitely is lower than Princeton. Because Princeton is about, if I remember correctly, about 5,000. And uh, Arizona State is 60,000. And Arizona State is extremely diverse. But as Michael said, I couldn't compete with Princeton if I would not grow. So maybe some universities like, again, like Princeton could uh, continue the strategy small as beautiful. But uh, probably if you are in competition and we think that we are in almost zero-sum game in this competition, the growth is the strategy. So how I, uh, our university, uh, what was the strategy of the growth? I will not go through each uh, uh, line in this slide. Uh, uh, the most important thing probably is to get as much talented students as you can accommodate. And if you can more talented students, you should have more accommodation. That's very simple. If you can have more talented professor, if you, uh, I, I can give you an example. The group of very talented uh, professors in Oriental Studies uh, from Moscow State University, don't quote me, they they got bored a bit in their own university. They didn't have enough resources, etc., etc. So they looked for better life. Our university didn't have School of Oriental Studies. They appeared. Uh, <laughs> so they came to us and said, do you want to have a good School of Oriental <laughs> Studies? And we said, definitely we want. <laughs> so now this is one of this is. Uh, uh, the, one of the most successful departments of our university. The same happened, uh, I can give you a couple of, uh, one example is even, I would consider ridiculous, uh, when the chef, uh, not the chef, the owner of the luxury chain of Moscow restaurants appeared and suggested to open undergraduate school of uh, high cuisine, high Moscow Culinary School. And we said, no, 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 that's enough. Uh, and you know, uh, the president of our university said, 
maybe we, we should consider. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't open it yet. We didn't open it yet, but I would be not surprised. And one of the reasons uh, we could, uh, pro we probably will do that because it's innovation. It will position our university not just as growing, but a, a, as an innovative university which attracts talents and energy. Uh, in fact, we see now, when you look at the system level, you can see that rich university becoming richer. This is a, this is a picture of Russian universities. And you see in two years, the share of just 35 universities uh, grew from 38, share of funding uh, from 38 to 43 percent, and it's continuing. So we see, again, uh, it looks like zero-sum gain. And there are theoretical explanations. In fact, uh, Jamil Salmi, who is here, uh, wrote in 2009 that uh, narrow uh, sectoral universities will uh, inevitably go to multidisciplinary model, or he called them specialist HIs. Simon Marginson from UCL, and now he also works with us, uh, uh, mentioned that multidisciplinary universities, uh, he refers to Barton Clark notion of multiversity, will become uh, uh, the dominant model. We see it, by the way, from growing number of university mergers, in, even in such well-established system like Northern Europe or France. One of the reasons of the great mergers in France is, uh, again, the growth uh, strategy. So we think that in the future, we should think more uh, about new model of university, which will become very big and very heterogeneous. And in fact, example of Sunny Buffalo, when they opened this strange uh, institute for uh, Jacobs Institute. Looks, it's very interesting. We, we've heard about recent acquisition of Kaplan Company by Great Research University, Purdue University. What does it mean? What, what is the model of new university, new successful university in this fast growing world? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not, I, was, I wasn't too sure about acquisition and mergers uh, <laughs> by universities. But we have Professor Wu on stage. Uh, is Vice President of uh, Renmin University of China. Uh, previously was the, the Executive Vice President of the Graduate School. But uh, much as our colleagues on the, um, on the, um, on the stage, is, a, is an economist and a professor of finance. So we have a lot of people who can count money on the stage. But I hope you can count time, seven minutes. OK. <laughs> There, there is uh, yeah. an uh, it, yeah, an interpreter. I can, I can understand. I can understand. I am. I. They hear you in my. I am uh, the Vice President of Remy University of no, China. No, 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 it's not, it's not working. Can you hear me in microphone? Okay, no problem. So I am the Vice President of Remy University of China and uh, it. Sorry, ex excuse me, can you hear me in microphone? Yeah. Yes? Okay, no problem. They don't all have microphones. They don't all have mic, yeah, they don't have, have uh, uh, trans test. Test a test. No. Yeah, but they don't have the phone. They don't have the earphone. They don't have the earphone. Uh, 
Now can, I, can you all speak Chinese? Or? <laughs> <laughs> so is there anyone who don't have a ear? This doesn't work. The mic is not working. So. <laughs> eh? Okay, okay. Oh yeah, yes. yeah, just speak. No problem. So he basically just introduced himself. Yeah, he didn't exactly. say anything. Yeah. Okay. Probably better. Can you hear? No. At the back? No. Yet, yet, yet. <laughs> Can you use this? <laughs> Okay, sorry. Okay, <laughs> uh, now you can hear me. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Vice President of Remy University of China. It's a great pleasure to be here and to give you a presentation at this panel session of the forum. Yeah. Uh, I very thank the University of China for inviting me to express my gratitude. And uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the staffs and all the participants of this uh, forum and also to Nazarbayev University. So today here at this forum, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of the latest developments of higher education in China and also something about our university. Uh, the higher education here in China has developed a very, uh, uh, has maintained a very strong development since 1978. Uh, with generations of efforts, we have explored a, a special and featured way of development for higher education in China. And the leap forward developments have been made uh, for our higher education. And we have maintained the largest uh, uh, and completed higher educational system in the world. The scale of our higher education keeps increasing and promoted the social and economic development of our country. So with the general development of our economy and the keep strengthening of our national power, our higher education is placed as a strategic priority for China. So by 2012, the Chinese government has made a huge investment in higher education. Our national budget of for higher education has accounted for 4% of the total GDP of China. Uh, 
the on-campus students have reached uh, uh, like uh, 36 million uh, people uh, by 2016 in China. Uh, in 2017, our Gauden So by 2017, our on-campus students has exceeded 37 million, which is two times larger than here in Kazakhstan. We every year so every year, about 9 million people in China would like to go to college. Today and yesterday are the days for the college entrance examination in China. About 200,000 young, uh, about, uh, yes, 200,000 uh, young people in China would like to go on to, uh, go for this college entrance examination and uh, this year. I think this number is very large in terms of the compared with other countries, and this is closely connected with China's huge population. So the total number of uh, students with uh, higher education is accounts for about one fifth of the total number of uh, students for higher education in the world. The net enrollment rate of China's higher education reached 43.7%, which is uh, higher than any country here in the world. Uh, so higher education has developed many high talents in of high qualities to China's uh, social and economic development. Uh, Although that we have a very large number of students with higher education degrees, but uh, we are now trying to improve our quality of higher education. Uh, so in the recent 20 years, uh, the country has uh, maintained uh, three projects to improve its uh, quality of higher education. The first one is 211 project, second one is 985 project, and the last one, and the latest one, is double first class project. Uh, now we are promoting the construction of but double first class universities and disciplines. So by a certain year, our many major disciplines and key universities will go into first class in the world. Uh, Last year, the Chinese government released our plan and outline for its double first class construction. About uh, a hundred and uh, about the a hundred and thirty seven universities in China has its disciplines entered the double first class construction plan. So 
So among those 137 universities, uh, almost they covered almost every disciplines of the country. For example, engineering, mathematics, chemistry, and also humanities and social sciences. Uh, so among them, 42 universities has entered the double first class university list. So Among those 42 universities, 36 universities are at the central uh, position. So our goal is that uh, by 2030, uh, by 2030, a number of universities will enter world class. And we are striving toward this goal. So second, I'd like to tell you more about our university's strive and strategy in our construction of double first class university. So Army University of China is among the 36 universities who are at the central position of uh, this construction of double first class university, and we are ranked pretty top. Uh, so our university is mainly focusing on humanities and social sciences. Uh, 工商管理、公共管理、政治學,以及新聞傳播學等,在中國的高校裡面都處在第一位。Especially uh, our major of economics, law, public and uh, business administration, communication and journalism are also ranking top nationwide. 我們和哈薩克斯坦大學中的那扎巴耶夫大學和歐亞大學都有很好的合作關係。we have maintained a close relationship with Nazarbayev University and the Eurasian National Universities. Uh, and our, our cooperation with NU will continue to deepen in the future. Uh, and so both universities, I believe, will enter world class in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pan. Don't, don't go. Don't go. Okay, yeah, go by that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. I'm saying you can see them, but you need the, the translator, the, translator over there. Uh, over there. Question We're going for question and answer. Okay. okay. Thank you. You yes. see, there's a, a plethora or a diversity of. Uh, Oh, I don't know whether they are best practices. Take a seat and we yeah. have discussion with uh, participants. We'll bring another. Already. I don't need a chair. <laughs> University to a big university. No, no, I'm not going to say big. Big, uh, what is it called? A university system with 36 million people. And he didn't forget to tell us that just the number of students, university students in China, is twice the population of Kazakhstan. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and he said Redmond University is going to specialize in the humanities. So. This morning, the, uh, the breakout session in humanities was actually very, very big. So humanities are to the breadth of what it must to be. I'm an engineer by myself, uh, myself, 
some of the best classes I took actually were my classes in philosophy, international relations, and political science. So in terms of trying to do interdisciplinary, okay, people talk about interdisciplinary. You have to have both. Because if I'm trying to have an interdisciplinary set on energy, I want somebody who's very, very good in physics, not just I mean, having a light knowledge of physics, but deep in that area. So both disciplinary and interdisciplinary education will always project itself into the future. So with that, do we have a pigeonhole? Yes, sir. OK. Ms. Annie Lowe, who contributes to the development of collective vision? He, oh, can you see? Can you see? No, no, here. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that? Our eyes are good. Our eyes are not good enough. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me. Ms. Which one? Number one, the okay. eight books. Eight books. Oh, yes. Right, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Anilo, who contributes to the development of collective vision that your organization advocates? What principles and values do your organization follow while consulting colleges? So, um, we, hello, okay, so, um, well, whenever we develop something, we have, as I shared with you earlier, we have a lot of schools in our network, and we have a lot of volunteers. In fact, AACSB, we have 90 staff around the world, but a lot of the work that we do are actually contributed by our volunteers from our member schools, and we have every year a thousand of volunteers working for us free of charge, you know, really just contributing back to the organization, back to the business school world. And uh, so this is really something that we got people together, you know, from different schools, and we all come, you know, talk about this uh, concept, talk about some of these things that are important. We get, we hear from different schools around the world, and we collect all of this, these very important, you know, values, and, you know, something that is important for our higher education you know, area that we really should focus on. So basically, it's a collective vision. That's why it's called collective vision. No, yes. That's great. She mentioned something called values. Every institution has to project its own values. You have to define what you want to be and how you're going to achieve it through your own strategy. So values are very important. And your alumni should be able to recite those values and leave it out because they become your ambassadors. So another question. Uh, how are world class and double force class okay, universities measured in China? How are they measured in China? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Move up the scroll up. So, according to the world class and double first class, uh, the Chinese government has a certain kind of uh, valuing system, and also we will refer to the uh, ranking companies such as Times and also QS. 这个包括自然科学、工程技术，这个我们称之为QS等国际的排名。In terms of natural science and engineering, we mainly refers to the international ranking companies, for example, QS. 啊，人工智能科学我们只是参考，因为人工智能科学特殊性，有些是哪里的两处，呃，它的国际的标准。As for humanities and social sciences. We refer a little bit to international rankings, but mainly we focus on the true quality of our uh, education because uh, humanities and social sciences have its special features. So the Chinese government has a special like uh, evaluating system for humanities and social sciences. And this evaluation is uh, conducted every four years. And uh, the result will be issued among 2,000 universities in China. So our world class construction is mainly based on these two uh, measuring systems. Смирение.
ölçüm. Some disciplines may be topped in China and also topped in the world. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Chief, which? Scroll up, scroll up. It's already up. There, there all the way up. up. Huh? Yes. What's that? It's all the way up. I mean. Okay, it's all the way up. Chief, which, which ranking do you believe in? Because usually, the, I mean, you quote the ranking that runs, that is to best, okay? Is that? Well, okay. thank you. That's exactly my answer, <laughs> which is I pick the ranking that ranks me best. <laughs> uh, um, so, I, um, on the other hand, if you wish to be world class, you have to compete with the, the standard rankings, yeah. whether it's QS, Jiao Kong, uh, US News. You simply have to compete. And um, that's what it would mean to be world class. Um, it means most universities are always not top, and therefore you're always chasing. Uh, you're always number two or lower, except for the number one. And uh, th this is the challenge that we always face is, um, how can you be distinct if you're always trying to compete with the number one university? And so that's the challenge, I think, that we always face with rankings is, how do you define your mission? How do you achieve your mission? And then how do you prove to your stakeholders you're good at achieving it? without going to a world ranking system. So that's just the tensions that we go after. Isaac, Isaac, you said you are number five in Russia. How did you come about that? Uh, top five, yeah? Top five, top five, yeah. Top five. Yeah, we, uh, in, in fact, in my slides, I used very objective indicators. It's not the ranking. We, we are number three in the average entrance exam, uh, uh, average GPE that, uh, or ENT that students enter. But we do have uh, national ranking and we do participate in uh, this game, what we call international ranking. And it's, it's becoming better, by the way. It's, it's becoming more objective, we collect. Uh, ranking themselves appeared because we uh, got the ability to create this vast amount of information and process it, especially around the publications and citations. In sciences, of course, as a, a Chinese colleague mentioned, it's easier to measure because you publish, 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 publish in terms of uh, journal papers, and it's very easy to collect them and look at impact factor, age index, but Always one has to be very careful in knowing what are behind those rankings. So you want to make sure that those things that, are, that prove what is called objective, you actually try to pursue it for your, for pursue those uh, elements for your own institution according to your values. But people try to gain this thing all the time. Uh, more questions here. Uh, number, mm, I cannot read number nine, the nine volts, sorry. Uh, can somebody read what is in the nine? The top. The top. Nine is a question to Professor Wu. What what percentage huh? of your what students percentage? are studying in English? Oh, okay. What percent? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so it's like in my university, even though only me, I cannot speak English. <laughs> all other people, including students, can speak very good English. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll invite you to Nazarbayev University. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> That's funny, actually. <laughs> okay. Number f uh, Annie. So everything is for Annie. What, yeah. What's going on here? Okay. Number f number this four. Hold there. Should Kazakhstan follow world class rankings? As far as I know, rankings do not accurately measure higher education. Well, you can say they do not measure higher education. I always said, if the ranking is out there, I want to be number one. Okay? Because you cannot get away from it. But one thing you have to know is, what are the values or the metrics behind the ranking? And how can you improve yourself objectively? 
whether it's the qualification of your students, the qualification of your professors, the amount of research that, that are being carried out, and where they publish. Because you know, those are the things that we actually, at least for the ranking itself, you have to believe it, and you have to really believe that your institution is at that level. Okay, so it's ex extremely uh, important. So for Nazarbayev University, we've decided we don't want to go into the ranking games until we are ready. Okay, because once we get pegged down somewhere, it's tough to move up. Okay, so for us, 2025, 2030, I think we feel comfortable in terms of say we are going to be we are going to be ranked. But uh, China, in China, I know they are putting a lot of money, a lot of resources. Okay, higher education depends on money to a large extent. If you want to participate in the ranking, you have to be able to functionalize your research. You have to build up, buy a lot of big toys to do science, if you want to specialize in the science. If you are in the humanities, you have to make sure that you have amount of resources to go around. Maybe if you are studying history, you go to the villages to travel. So those are all the things that you need. I, I okay. think. So, go ahead. Uh, my recommendation on this would be that um, Adi always wants to be number one. As yeah. I said, there's only one, one number, number one. one. Yes. The rest of us aren't number one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but the reason why one would participate in world-class rankings is not necessarily to be number one, but in order to establish metrics and see how you change from year to year. If you don't measure it, you won't achieve it. And therefore, you, you ought to look at what goes into the rankings and what's measured, and then work against those in areas that you wish to improve. And that's basically what the world rankings do. They give you a sense of if everybody's improving, are you improving faster or slower than people okay. that are universities that are around mm -hmm. you? So it would be foolish not to pay attention mm -hmm. to the rankings and the components of them because it's, it's a look in the mirror to see whether or not you're actually improving the way you're teaching and the way you're doing scholarship. And uh, uh, I fully support what Charles said because, yeah. and it's particularly important for young universities. Uh, uh, I've learned this year that uh, the first prototype of university ranking was created when, uh, almost 400 years ago, by the way, when the uh, uh, government of Utrecht in the Netherlands decided to open a university, they commissioned a paper to compare existing universities and to show what to learn from them. So, the, as Charles said, uh, the ranking rankings uh, allow yourself to look and compare in different aspects. And it's, for young universities, it's vital. Okay. Uh, let's go to, uh, let's see, Professor Frumin, how do you see the future, number three, how do you see the future of Project 5, 5 to 100? Is, oh, that, that, is that a project in Russia? Yeah, that's a Russian excellence initiative. That's okay. a project to support international competitiveness of Russian universities. I, uh, I, I have to say that uh, it was one of the most successful projects when the government decided to finance very clear proposals from the universities. And in fact, uh, Jamil was part of the designers team for this project. And um, it, it's interesting because it puts universities in the competition with each other, but not in terms of getting uh, blessings from, uh, from the governments or from the country leaders, but uh, using real metrics, uh, as we just said. So I, they I, increase the funding? For yes, the the, they, gave, they gave targeted funding for some uh, activities that helps universities to go up in terms of research publications and internationalization. Yeah. So what does are, what are the 5 and 100? Uh, 5 and 100, it's a political slogan. It's to have five Russian universities in uh, first 100 okay. in the international ranking. Okay. As uh, Charles mentioned, there are only 100 places in first 100. <laughs> so, uh, so it's that's, not... That's a clear revelation. Yeah. We don't think that uh, this goal will be achieved. Okay. But uh, uh, the, the speed and the progress 
uh, will be significant. Okay, okay. Thank you. We have one or two more questions because we have we've run out of time. Chip, what lessons have you learned at UB about leading change initiatives? Um, I think the, what, I, what I have learned is that there are time constants for change and they're long. Uh, that we live in a, cons we in higher ed live in a conservative society and um, it's, it is hard to get, to move the cheese is, is hard to do. People are used to going one direction, you move the cheese and they're very unhappy. And um, uh, convincing them that we should change how we teach, what we teach, how we should manage deans or how we should manage faculty leads to a lot of dissatisfaction. And um, we, I, you see it in the United States now, there's a tremendous turnover in presidents and provosts and deans and that's largely because they're desperate to drive change and that change leads to dissatisfaction of stakeholders and so they get turfed out. And um, so one of the major things that I've learned is the effort that has to go into working with the, all of the stakeholders, the faculty, let's say your board, the government, uh, in order to pick the areas that you, where you want to change and then you have to lean on them and you have to be there. You can't turn over too fast your leadership because it takes a lot of time in order to drive really substantial change in higher education. So that's probably the major lessons that I've learned. I, I, I honestly, I take my program and I think of it as sort of a pipe and I push all sorts of things into it so they can be transformed and come out the bottom. And I put in so much, nothing comes out the bottom. And it's because I've jammed the system. Nothing, so I have to slow down. The rate you can put things through the pipe of change is limited. That's what I've learned. <laughs> Uh, I've heard of That's professors being like told metaphor. in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> now I've seen professors like rats moving the cheese. So <laughs> I did how, not say how that. How many professors are here for God's sake? <laughs> okay, yeah, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, look, higher, higher education is actually the most conservative. We are supposed to drive change, lead change, and we invent a lot of stuff, but professors, as I've learned, do not want to change. Oh, how come? I'm successful. I've taught this class for 30 years. Why do you want me to change it? That's always the question. And when you want to try and, as I said, if you want to try and lead this change and lead it very fast, uh, creates a lot of uh, heartache and professors are very difficult to fire professors, at least, I don't know. Uh, in the US, it's very difficult to fire professors. They fire you, okay? That's, that's what you learn very fast. One last question. Any question from the, from the... Uh, We're out of time. Huh? We're out of time. I know. It's, it's telling me I'm out of time, but I want one more question. <laughs> Any question from somebody? Yeah. Or pick one from the, from the screen. Let's do Yeah, yeah. Okay, one more from the screen. Which one? What are the four steps to create an interdisciplinary center or on or off the, oh, on or off the university campus? Oh. Huh? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the first steps are to um, get the core of the fact, get the core of the idea and bring the faculty together. When it came to the Jacobs Institute, um, it was started because there was a beloved professor on campus who had developed a drug that fought multiple sclerosis. He died, his family wanted to honor him and they gave the university $10 million, but they didn't give it to the university. They said, we want it for a program that is actually controlled outside the university that will drive um, economic development. When we build multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary centers on campus, um, you have to incentivize them quite often. In other words, you hold out, um, I want a center, I want proposals, here's the money people get together then according to the rules. That's another way that it's done. What has surprised me about our educational programs, these multidisciplinary educational programs, is they're driven by the faculty who want to work together to develop these new educational programs. Some of that you could say is driven by money in our business model. Tuition dollars flow back to units that teach and as a result um, you're looking for students and if the 
students want this broader educational program, um, then you're going to develop that program. You're following the customer, if you will, whether that's the student or outside society that will hire those students or value that degree. So you always start with, um, I would say, some sort of incentivation package and, and the faculty interest in creating either a research area or a, an educational program. That's how we develop them at, at UB. Well, we're out of time, but uh, what you've learned today is that there are, as we say in where I came from, many roads lead to the market. <laughs> many roads lead to success. So each institution will pick their own path. Each individual will pick their own pathway. So the, what you want at the end is success. So can institutions put opportunities in place for people to be successful? To navigate your own way, figure out what you want to do, and take the opportunities and meld it together to chart a path. So thank, please, let's thank our, our, thank you. our panel. And uh, is it break time? No break, no, no break time. I'll give it to you. I have okay. to on my back. We have to continue. Yeah. My business school.